so we've probably spent probably eight years reinventing the wheel so many times to the point now where the boxes now are just incredible. Um, you know, our cooling technology, we, we work with cooling guys incredibly well with different liquids, different fan types, different radiators, different piping. You know, it's, it's all now for us is the way we make money out of this business is being reliable. Yeah. And we're now pretty much at enterprise level reliability, you know, failure rates are less than 2%. Um, you know, it, it, it's been a, a, a fascinating journey. And now we're, you know, and there has been some advancements like Intel with Sapphire Rapids was way better than Cascade Lake in terms of a technology. Um, it just seems the silicon is so much better now. So yeah. obviously we heat these up incredibly. You know, we're running these at production level at like 80, 90 degrees. Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Making Happen by Sims podcast. Today I'm joined by a very special guest. I have Nick Rogers, uh, founder and CEO of Exact Technologies, who, in, who build incredibly bespoke solutions uh, that we'll be discussing today. Uh, Nick, thanks for joining. How are you? Yeah, very well, thank you. And thanks for the invite. No problem. Um, so I won't go into too much about explaining exactly what Exact as a group does myself, I'll leave that to you. Um, you know, but one thing's for sure, the company's really developed a pace from its inception. Um, I believe in a garage workshop and that's how most amazing companies are built, right? So um, to one of the UK's only companies that really offer custom technology design and build services. So let's take a look back um, at that timeline from around 2001, I believe. Is that what yes, it's correct? correct? Yeah. Um, to sort of understand the development and then we'll go into the solutions a bit more in the businesses within the group, the black core and, and platform in a bit more detail, uh, if you don't mind. Um, and of course, within this as the founder, our listeners want to know a little bit more about yourself as an entrepreneur. So I'll hand it over to you there. Yeah. So back in 2001, I was, um, so I've had two jobs, I suppose you could say. Um, so when I set up Exactor, I previously from the age of 18, I worked for a Bristol-based computer company, which were formerly an American uh, company called CompuAd. Um, and then at the back end of the 90s, early 2000s, they were taken over by CompuSys. And like these things happen, it, they closed the operation in Bristol. They left about out of 50 workforce, left about eight of us. Um, and I was offered at the time a job with HP. Um, but it was that whole compact acquisition thing with HP back in the day um, and they froze all job offers and in between that I had a customer of ours say look Nick you know what we want why don't you just go off and build it and uh, I ended up doing exactly that so did I have an ambition to start my own business absolutely not I barely ran myself none about running a, a, a team um, and so you know Exacto was born and it was literally in those days taking a PC a standard desktop and sticking someone else's badge on it and then sell it to them as part of their solution. Um, and, you know, over the time that that's just evolved really to, to where we are today. So, you know, it, it's, you know, when we talk about a garage, we actually, it wasn't so much a garage. It was actually a self storage unit, um, which was 600 square foot. And I remember we moved in, it was minus nine outside. We had no heating. Um, and I said, boys, this is, Life now, this is how it's going to be. Um, so it was, uh, yeah, interesting times, but it's uh, it's led us to sort of a, a long journey to where we are right now. Excellent. Great. So I think, and just and correct me if I'm wrong, the, the first solution, the first business that came out of that is the, the solution you have now called Platform? Yeah, so we're, we're in the process right now of having a little bit of a realignment. Um, so Xacta fundamentally was a software solution market sale if you like so there's a lot of customers out there who have got their own products their own software solutions whether it be a firewall cctv um a multitude of other software solutions which need a piece of hardware for it to sit mm. on right um and, and what we fundamentally came up with was as a software vendor and you're selling a piece of hardware out into your your market space it's easy just to go and put that on a Dell or a Supermicro or a HP or, or whatever that might be, Lenovo. The list is endless of different vendors of solutions. 
But what we could do is actually make that product in your identity. So if your logo was purple and blue, we could make a purple and blue chassis. We could just, it may be just a simple logo that goes on the front of an Intel unit with a custom front bezel or whatever that might look like. But the solution just didn't stop uh, creating a beautiful looking piece of kit. And let's face it, IT is pretty boring. Um, so this give it a little bit of bling, a little bit of, you know, pizzazz, if you like, in terms of making it look cool. But the solution just doesn't stop at what it looks like. It creates us to be able to um, install software, set the things up for the customer. They may be able to remote come into the box and they need to set the final test up. We do a lot of security software. So you can imagine a lot of customers don't like us having access to that software. So they would take control of that remotely. And then once they're finished, we lock it down. We will then create their own cardboard box for that box to go in. And then we will logistically ship that anywhere in the world. Mm. Um, and it goes even with the with a delivery note, which has their logo on it. Yeah. So in terms of the customer facing piece, and you could argue that a lot of these boxes go into a data center or they go into a rack. And once the door's closed, you never see it. But I'm a massive advocate of out-of-box experience. We all love it when we buy an Apple product or something which is pretty cool. That It just looks like it's for the purpose. Um, yeah. I mean, I've just come in on that. Actually, I, I previously worked for a DC um, and, you know, we took a lot of clients and we would tour them around a the DC. They tour their own clients, our own customers and it's a bit cringy, but behind every rack is a story, right? And your your piece of hardware can really tell that. So having these bits of kits that are truly customizable and 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 really brand reflective is, is quite important for these for these customers. Yeah, no, I think so. And it's like, it's what we built exactly on the back the basis of, and and you know that that's sort of now sort of now morph morphosized now into what is called platform. And platform is exactly what it is. It's the whole thing, you know, start to end. So I mean, let's give you a prime example of how our service, if you like, the whole offering changed a particular customer environment is this, right? So we had a customer and they did a firewall for schools solution, um, shipping probably 100 appliances a month. So what they were doing before they came to us, they were buying from a Chinese vendor. Um, they would place an order for half a million quid of, of, of hardware. They would send half a million quid out to China. They would then build that product. 12 weeks later, it would go on a boat. Four to six weeks later, it arrived at a holding center in Germany. The Germans would take them out, put their logo on the front of the box, ship it then to the customer, um, i.e. the software vendor, not the end customer, the software vendor, um, where they would apply their software and then they would send it to the school. Right. So this whole process would take 18 weeks. So that's 18 weeks and I start returning half a million quid right, mm -hmm. before you can even start invoicing. And most schools are on 60 days. So you could add another two months to that. So you can just see the amount of cash is outstanding. They now order from us up to three o'clock in the afternoon and we deliver it to school next day. So we have the whole logistic thing. It's all the boxes are built. We use their six models. We have got probably 20 to 30 models built and specced and boxed and packed all on the shelf. Yeah. So it's a very, very neat service. And it just, you know, and that's just a typical customer of what we do. And it just works massively for them. And you can yeah. just see they, they've just, it, it's changed their whole dynamic of their business. Um, it's a bit cash expensive for us, but that's part of the world we live in, right? Yeah, it is, and, it's, and you need to be that way to offer the service you do, right? And and obviously, you've met, you touched on schools there, as I believe this is probably something that works for most industries, right? Or are you particularly strong in certain industries for this? No, not at all. Um, you know, obviously, most of what we're doing are what is classed as network appliances, right? So whether it'll be video analytics, whether it be, um, like I said, firewalls, um, we do a lot of bank security solutions we've got um, we've got one customer specializes in gchq level nasa style internet unravel re-ravel type things that um is far over my head as as much as it can be but very secure devices and, and need a very specific piece of tin and i think part of our thing and what we've been really good at is most customers' software is very specific to the bit of tin it sits on. Yeah. 
So where you would go down the Dell route or the HP route, you'd order a product and it's possibly not what turns up. They would go, well, we're going to give you something better. Well, that's great. But in some ways, it's not great because now the software doesn't work with it and they got to rewrite some software, especially when you're talking like Linux embedded stuff and the software is very specific to what goes on. So with us, we pretty much lock product. Any changes, we generally give the customer 120 days notice of any change. So we're always stocking far ahead for what we're building. Yeah. Um, so it's a little bit more than just, you know, we've long gone of the days of just we're a bit of tin building. You know, that's not what we're about. We're about that whole lock-in for the customer. Um, yeah, so, it, you know, most customers, I would have said probably three years we lock the product for. Um, but, you know, some of it were forced changes. You know what the industry's like. It's it's fast moving. Yes. Um, but we got one customer and they're still buying technology from seven years ago because yeah. they don't want to change it because their software is so archaic. But it does what it does, um, yeah. which is also challenging to get when you're trying to buy Pentium Ds. But yeah. not that. But <laughs> no, I understand. <laughs> and what sort of size are we, are we saying for these systems? Are these one U, two U? Or... Yeah, generally one and two U. Um, um, so it depends, you know, obviously from a from a business perspective and what we try and target is that larger end appliance. But, you know, we're, we will talk to anybody. You know, if there's an opportunity, we'll, we'll, we'll try and manipulate that situation to make it work. Yeah. Um, you know, and excuse the pun, but we're greedy. We uh, massively have an appetite for growth. Um, and we're, we're continuing looking at best ways to attract more customers. Um, so if there's anybody out there, then obviously pick up the phone. <laughs> no, and I think this, this ex, you know, it's always exciting to be looking for growth. And I think that's what companies should be aiming for, right? So is has there always been growth in the UK or have you always looked at No, do you know what? It's, it's, it's a real weird one, this Drew, because obviously we started in 2001 and we ran the business and it wasn't until probably 2019 that it was one of those where probably halfway through that year it was we run the business to about three million quid every year we've run 18 years of profitable business never made a loss um always generally healthy with cash and run a pretty secure business you know probably 12 11 12 staff um and it was a good lifestyle business right and i think we got to that 2019 middle part of that year and i just had this moment where are we going to grow this or are we not? Or what are we doing with this? It was one of those, do we just flip it and just try and give it to someone else to try and do something weird? Yeah. And then I just happened to have bumped into like a, a we were at a pension seminar and trust me, I'm not <laughs> one for going to pension seminars, but it was at a Concord <laughs> Museum. So what the hell? Um, so I went there and there was a guy there talking about building a business and, and to sell it. Um, and it sort of flicked a nerve. So we started talking to them and it turns out they would sort of a unravel your business, put it back together and what could you actually do with it? And um, they did a really good job on me, actually. And um, it really gave me a real thought provoking moment of. I'd like to build this. I'd like to really become like a really good customer. And we were probably a couple of years into to, um, coming up with Black Hole. Uh, yeah. which we'll talk a little bit more of in a, in a, in a minute about. Um, but they did this really great job on me about just what we do. And there's a fantastic um, advert they created for us, which was which was that moment where I went, we've really got something here. Yeah. And we just don't realize it. Yeah. Um, and I had a business partner at the time, and um, he was very pro this until my big idea was, we had a lovely business unit out in um, the Chew Valley, um, which was beautiful. It was looked over a lake. It was fantastic. But the whole building was falling apart. It was about 6,000 square foot of horribleness. And we built onto areas we shouldn't have done. It was just not a great example of what we could potentially be. Yeah. Um, and then I found this building we're in now, which was at um, Emerson Screen, just north of Bristol. Yeah. And they built a new sort of business park which was next to the new big dpd hub in 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 north bristol and i thought this is it this this could change us i was absolutely convinced of it and and i just knew it was going to be the start of things 
And we moved in on the day of lockdown in 2020, took the keys, did half a million pound refit to the building. And it is just a phenomenal place to be. And I think, you know, everybody walks through the door. It, it's a great working space we, we've created. Mm. Um, and we had challenges, you know, there was, like I said, 11, 12 of us moved into the building. We come off the back of 2019 doing 3.7 million, I think we turned over. Uh, and, uh, you know, profitable 3.79 million. There's no doubt about it at all. But obviously taking our rent from three and a half grand a month to 20 grand a month um, with the leases signed to redo the refit and then got told, go home. Yeah. It was I a bit of a worry. Um, but that year we managed to scrape seven and a half million. So we went for a really good growth spurt, um, mm. managed to increase staff by about 30%. So that was good. We were now up to sort of 16, 17 people, which was fantastic. Um, and felt it was a good, good momentum we got going. And, and from then, really, we've driven it hard. Um, and, and last year, we, we, we hit the dizzy heights of 15 million for us, which is which was fantastic. Um, and, you know, this year to date, our, our fiscals is January to December. We're already 56 percent up on last year. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm looking at big things. So it's, it's been a really good journey. No, it sounds amazing. Thank you for that insight. That's, that's really, really, really great. So I just want to take it back to the pandemic. And, and obviously, you, the time that you went through this growth, obviously, just hit the hit the moment that happened. What are the challenges that you that you faced through that? Because it sounds like you come out of it, you know, pretty sunny side up in some aspects. But there must have been some challenges. Obviously, we know that with staff and obviously not being allowed in the building. But was there anything in terms of getting hold of components and things like that that really affected you? Yeah, I mean, look, all of what you all of you just said, then you could go, yeah, yeah. Yeah, all of that was challenging. You know, firstly, you can not work from home and build boxes, right? That's a yeah. bit of a challenge in itself. So we d- we went through this. What do we do? Now, we had this massive 20,000 square foot building with 11, 12 staff in it. So it felt like the social distancing thing could, could be a, a journey that would work. But we took it one step further where we did... There was, I think we had eight guys downstairs at the time um, in our production. So we did four in for four days and then the next four in for another four days and just kept running it like that. And that was, we did that for about six weeks and then we realized straight away, although it's working, we're too busy. So we brought everybody back and, you know, tried the social distancing thing. And then obviously, then what happens towards that summer we all come out of lockdown, but then obviously all, as you know, products, supply, everything had dried up. Yeah. Um, but, you know, there's there's one thing about us, Drew, and I think, you know, hopefully you guys see that as, as one of our suppliers that, you know, we're pretty cool to deal with. I don't, we, we're not runner and ravers. We, we work really hard with those relationships um, and we treat our vendors like we treat our customers, right? And, you know, I, I think we got product where we shouldn't have. Um, and, you know, we'd be forever thankful for that. Um, but it kept us going. And I think the other thing that benefited us as well is the fact that we didn't, we, we don't buy multitudes of everything. You know, we have our set product lines. We have customers buying specific products from us. So we could really plan that all the way through. And yeah. I think that got us through it quite well. Um, yeah. And obviously we've got massively strong relationships with Intel, um, whether it be WD, whether it be Seagate, whether it be Micron, you know, all the major vendors that we could work and, and really forecast quite accurately yeah. into that. And, you know, we're running, relying on our customers. And, you know, we have one particular customer software company in Dublin who were buying, you know, tons of, of, of equipment, which was really, you know, they they saw the, 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 the pandemic as an opportunity yeah. rather than as a hindrance. And, you know, everyone was slowing down and we were just going like, through the roof so it was um you know in a way it, it sort of helped us in a way if, if, if that makes sense yeah no great i think the, the key thing you hit on there is forecasting right and and working with partners in that way to actually you understand between each other what's actually needed to, to work between both of you so that's the key thing right yeah no absolutely great cool so i just want to take it back a few years from 2019 and i think it was around 2015 that, that blackpool was launched so this is another business within the group alongside um, alongside platform, so let's discuss plat- uh, Blackcore a little bit. Um, so, if you can just give a bit, bit of an overview of what that is, and then we're obviously talk around the needs and issues, obviously within that product, within trading and financials, and how you guys are, are meeting needs there. 
Yeah, so we were approached in 2015 by a, um, a, tr a trading firm. Um, so they bought one of our uh, client solutions um, via one of our software resellers. Um, and they come to us and they said, look, we want to buy some servers from you. Um, can you can you help us out? And we were like, yeah, yeah, of course. What are you after? And then they say, well, yeah, we need liquid cooled servers. Right. And I was like, you what? <laughs> What do you mean, liquid cold servers? Yeah, yeah, you know, like gaming rigs. <laughs> In a server. I was like, this sounds like a recipe for disaster. <laughs> um, and so we, we ended up in the space of six weeks or so is developing a product. And we have Mark Lawrence, who was at Intel, who had, took his early redundancy from, from, from Intel. Um, and together we sat down, brainstormed it a little bit and came up with an idea to create a liquid cooled server and it was literally a gaming rig in, in, inside a server so to explain why liquid cooled is required mm. um it's it's the speed of the processor so the faster we can drive a cpu from a gigahertz megahertz point of view um the bigger the cache the harder we can push that system um is the more we can throw a trade at a solution yeah. So ideally, in a fundamentally way of being, you know, in layman's terms, these are glorified fruit machines, right? So the more cash you put into it, the more you you drive, if you like, the 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 spread betting through these boxes. Mm -hmm. And you know, you buy a bit of stock in one country, it's probably broke in another country and sold in another country, and it's trying to hedge to say that that little fraction of a cent will change between it gets there now the more times you can do that every second the more chance you've got of winning so and i've probably explained this incredibly incorrectly but that's my take on it no, um so if anybody was out there is going to say what well, i said when well, there probably is um but i would say that um you know for us right now when i look back at when we first started this mm. you know we were probably doing our boxes could handle about eight thousand trades a minute yeah. Now our boxes have handle more than 20,000 trades a minute. Yeah. Um, and I think the difference between our boxes now than where we are, we are, we are all about the design. You know, we've got, it's not just about liquid cooling and making an overclocking rig inside a server. Mm. It's been able to do that at production grade level. So if you took a 24 core CPU, which traditionally runs at 3.6 gig, we were production grade that at 4.9 gig yeah. on all 24 cores. And we have customers buying 24, 30 of those boxes at a time. And every single one of them absolutely has to be identical. Yeah. Um, and also has to be reliable. It was costing more money to replace the boxes. We had some boxes we'd replace five times in a year. You yeah. know, that's not a business model to work on. And, you know, it doesn't take long to work out. That's not great. So we probably spent probably eight years reinventing the wheel so many times to the point now where the boxes now are just incredible. Um, you know, our cooling technology, we've, we've worked with cooling guys incredibly well with different liquids, different fan types, different radiators, different piping. You know, it's, it's all now for us is the way we make money out of this business is being reliable. Yeah. And we're now pretty much, at enterprise level reliability, you know, failure rates are less than 2%. Um, you know, it, it, it's been a, a, a fascinating journey. And now we're, you know, and there has been some advancements like Intel with Sapphire Rapids was way better than Cascade Lake in terms of a technology. Um, it just seems the silicon is so much better now. So yes. obviously we heat these up incredibly. You know, we're running these at production level at like 80, 90 degrees um and that, that's why we use liquid to cool it so yeah. so so um so strong strongly but and i think it's whilst our hardware is fantastic and it is don't get me wrong um it's also the way we work with our clients i mean my team is incredible you know how we actually get underneath the bonnet of most trading firms who are so cloak and dagger about everything they do and they just mm -hmm. open up they allow us to really tweak the boxes to work so well with their software yeah. And it's just allowed us now to become that real go-to. Yeah. Um, the opportunities we get now on a day-to-day -day basis is incredible. And I think we've worked hard with the brand as well, Drew. I think the yeah. brand has been incredible. 
Um, I mean, Chloe and and the, the marketing team have just been, you know, it's been a real nice place to be over the years to actually get us to where we are now. And I think we're now, you know, where before we were maybe a little bit of a disruptor. Mm. I think now we're more of a go-to, you know, what are Blackcore doing? Yeah. Where before it was like we were just trying to disrupt the market a little bit. And now we're, you know, people now want to be part of this journey with us and they're understanding how we're doing it. And we're starting now for the first time to get into the big deployments, you know, customers wanting, you know, if we were to deploy 500, what would that look like? And so for us, that's become a, you know, and it is a, it, it's been a long journey to get to where we are. Um, and, and probably last year was the first time we started to really make some serious money out of it, where before it's always been like a break-even business because of the amount of unreliability in, in the piece. Yeah, sure. And I, I suppose, and again, kudos to you you guys and the brand. You're very open about the systems in terms of, you know, you, you're always using the best-in-class enterprise nuts and bolts, essentially, is what we see here at Sim. So they put, obviously, from the, the RAM to the storage, you know, you're constantly looking for the latest and greatest to push these machines on, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. It's, it's definitely, um, you know, and, and again, with, with Black Hawk, it's the same components. You know, you buy 20 this month and you buy 20 in three months' time, same product. Unless, you know, and these guys are pretty stringent on what they want as well because their algorithms, you know, we don't get involved with software on these. These boxes will go out blank. Yeah. But the amount of testing we do to the boxes, we could have boxes on test for three weeks trying to get them tweaking. We've been quarter of a million pounds worth of CPUs last year, yeah. uh, just in terms of they, they make the grade. Um, yeah. So it's it's an expensive journey to be part of this, um, but it works. And, you know, for us in, you know, on a, I will say as well, I think the boxes look really cool as well. They, everyone yeah. hates them in the racks because everyone knows they're black hole. They've got a great big bloody thumb print on the front, which is illuminated green and you can see it from space. Yeah. Um, so, but it's part of that whole brand thing. We want people to be saying, you know, I want an overclock server. You don't look at anybody else. You just look at Black Corp because they're the ones to do it and they know what they're doing. And yeah. that's sort of where we, we've come with it, really. Yeah. It sounds like you guys are not really ever standing still. And, and one of those things, and again, I'm not sure if it's something that you, you'll have to work with your clients from, with, but obviously AI is very, very important and, and it's demanding, especially in these industries. Are you seeing much change there or much not really. Um, we've we've had a couple of in the last probably two or three months. Um, we've seen the first clients come to us and say we're we're going to trial an AI style solution. Yeah. Um, AI trading frightens the bejeevers out of me. I've got to be honest. If you're leaving a computer to actually go off and do its own thing with millions and trillions of dollars, that does scare me quite a lot. But um, you know the solutions we have tried so far, they have been like 120, 130 grand systems. So in a way, there's one part of me is going and there's another part of me is going. Yeah. Um, so it's, it is that little, it's, it's a winner, but I don't think it's, it's certainly not a big thing as yet, but you tell me a bank or a trading firm somewhere on pioneering AI somewhere. I mean, it's, it's just a thing, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And you guys sound quite unique in what you're doing and how you've got to where you've got. Is is there anyone else out there, especially in the UK, really doing it to the level that you guys are doing? Not in the UK. Um, no, and that's all good to say. Do you know what I mean? And, you know, you can always learn from your peers anyway. We see it in all, all of our industries and the, the customers that we deal with, right? So, no, and I think that's a really great explanation of the business, the technology you guys produce and how you go about things. So I just want to talk about you guys a bit more. And, and it really sounds to me like you're becoming a bit of a tech leader in the Southwest. So... Just from a community standpoint. In the world. In the world. In, really. in the world. In the world. Sorry, Nick. In the world. Yeah, exactly. I've got that completely wrong. Um, but from a community standpoint, you know, what in terms of charity work and upcoming events, how are you guys really making a difference in Bristol and the surrounding area? Yeah, so we always, we're, we're trying to do a lot of things to support, um, you know, obviously, first thing, you know, we've gone from, like I said, we moved into this building, we had 11 people, right? We're now over 50. We've got an office in New York, which has got, we're, we're, we're staff in that office. Um, so the first thing is obviously we're creating, you know, for us as a business, for me to pioneer this business is, is trying to create a really good working culture, right? That, that's the fundamental thing which we want to create. Make it enjoyable for people to come to work every day. It's a simple thing. People enjoy, they want to do more. 
Yeah. You know, uh, I'm not saying every member of staff will run for a war, but I would be asking questions if they don't. Um, but, you know, on the whole, it's it's create something which is not a mundane thing to come to work, you know. And, you know, we've got staff now have been with me since the beginning. Um, last year, for example, we never lost a member of staff. We, in, we, we added 20 to our headcount and no one left. But on the whole, I think, you know, we, we do create the right, way of 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 employing um we do lots of incentives like david lloyd membership for all the staff and lots of other perks around health and just well-being that we're very big advocator of that and, and just keep people healthy yeah that, that, that's one of the fundamentals for this and just you know like i said come to the building it's it's a beautiful sales brochure right it works as you come through and then in terms of what we try and then do is look to outreach into other areas. And one of the charities that um, we've been an advocator of now for two or three years, I lost my mum when I was 13. Um, and it was, you know, at 13 years of age, you, you know, there, is, there wasn't no such thing as counsel in there. Um, so I remember my mum dying on a Wednesday and I went to school the next day. That was what you did. It was 1983 for Christ's sakes. Mm. Um, and yeah, it was a hard time and, you know, probably until I started dealing with grief and cancer, I didn't even think about it until then. And that obviously opened up. And and, and so for over the last three years, we've probably raised 60 odd thousand pounds for them. Um, we've done golf days. I did this crazy tennis charity, which we play tennis for 12 hours straight. Um, and, you know, we will continue to work with that charity. And that's been a, a, you know, a fantastic thing. And we will continue to be involved with them. And we were, we're doing another golf day this year on the 5th of September, which is an amazing event. Last year, we raised nearly £24,000 for that event, which was wow. incredible. Um, and, you know, the way this charity works with kids who have lost a parent, basically, um, and it, it's amazing. It's 20,000 children every year uh, lose a parent. Um, and this charity is just incredibly underfunded and um, overworked. So for, for me and for the rest of the staff who have got behind this uh, have been fantastic. And after the work we've done with that, we've now, <clears throat> there's another charity in Bristol called Community of Purpose. So they, they're a very good advocator of entrepreneurship. Also, we, we're doing a big sponsorship this year with them, um, which um, I think is, uh, I think in July? June. June. Uh, so June, they've got a massive football tournament. Um, which is going to have over a thousand kids. And it's a great thing. They bring kids out of very low income schooling to private school kids, bring them all together, put them into teams, and then just have a big football tournament throughout the day. So it just really brings together as a community thing. So we're going to have every kid gets a football kit. It's going to have a nice little exacto logo on the front of it. But it's something which we're going to get really behind. And a lot of the staff are getting involved. They're going to do that. So, um, yeah, so from a from a charity thread, we're pretty full on and we want to try and give back to the community as much as we can. No, that's brilliant. And thank you for sharing all of that. That's that's that's, that's incredible. And you know, just just looking at you guys and the passion in your voice, you know, from the community to the technology to the culture, it sounds like you guys are in a really strong place and and the strides that you've made from what you've told me from 2019 is, is really incredible and what an important meeting you took at that time, right? The pension thing was great. So yeah, no, um, absolutely. Yeah. So and just, just to finish this off and just finish off a really great podcast and something I like to do, my guests is is just about looking to the future. And I think the right thing to ask you here is just what does the future look like from exactly from this point if you sort of look in the next five, 10 years, just for our listeners? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, look, we're, we're continually looking to grow. We've got um, an aggressive target this year to take 25% on what we did last year, which, you know, last year we grew by 87%. So to try and replicate that, and it gets hard, you know, every time you have a big year, it gets hard. Mm. Um, so I think, you know, for this year is continue with the growth. We want to try and head to that 18, 20 million mark for us, which would be a you know fantastic year. Like I said, we are 56% up on last year already. So we're, we're in a good start. It's not bad. It's just keeping that momentum going through this year. And look, we would like, you know, the, no, it's not a like. We wouldn't like. We are committed to making this into a 100 million business over the next five years. That's our bottom line. And, you know, that's what we want to be doing. We want to be, you know, we want global dominance. Yeah, we're very specialist in what we do. And we feel there's enough tech that we can deliver into the global marketplace, which warrants us doing what we do in clients working with us. And, and 
you know, with real appetite. We, you know, we've got our office now in New York, but we, you know, we're starting, this building's great and it's fantastic. Um, but, you know, there may be opportunities in the, in the future where, you know, we're going to creak a little bit. Hence the reason why we felt it was a, a really good thing to, to, go, to do right now. Um, and yeah, well, that, that's, that's our plan really is we've got no ambitions really for investment. You know, we've, we've self-funded the business since 2001. We've never took investment. Um, you know, I, I, well, like I said, I had a business partner who had shareholding and, you know, I will be a hundred percent shareholder. So I don't really need, you know, we got, we're in a good place with cash. We're in a good place with lots of things, which really help drive this business. And that may change as we get super growth. Um, but right for this minute, it's a really enjoyable place we're in. Um, it works well. I believe that we've got a fantastic energetic team um, that, that really helped deliver our products into the market space, whether it be the guys who are next to me on the call, you can't see. Um, from a marketing perspective, right down to the guys who, who technology invent. We've got a full R&D team. You know, we've got 3D printers, some of the stuff. We, we now employ software engineers, which I never thought we'd do. Mm. Uh, um, you know, helping, you know, manipulate better processes to get kit out the door quicker, make it more reliable, make those processes better. So there's just a, a lot of energy, which, which we do, which, you know, energizes our customers, what we got right now to want more. And, you know, there, there's... You know, we got a lot of headroom to be able to to do more, and then we're looking to do that. There's no doubt about it that we are going places, as they say. Brilliant, nice. It looks, sounds like a very exciting journey to, to continue on from what I've heard today, and I've learned a lot about you guys that I didn't know. So, and obviously, Sims, we're excited to be a part of that moving forward for you guys. So, yeah, I want to thank you for coming on to this podcast and being so open about everything. And it's been a really, really brilliant chat. And uh, yeah, I will. Uh, hopefully catch up with you face to face eventually very soon so no thank you very much nick really appreciate it no you're welcome no worries at all thank you cheers bye-bye bye